Welcome to the spring semester. We're going to continue to learn more calculus. What we're covering in this section, the first part of this section anyway, is actually Calc 1 information. But I choose to hold it until the spring semester so that we can get our bases covered with differentiation and integration. And so now we're going to talk about different applications of the integral. And of course the definite integral accumulates area in the plane starting at A, stopping at B, and it's the area trapped in between the plane and the horizontal axis for this function. And remember this says add up infinitely many rectangles starting at A, stopping at B where your function is the height and the tiny change in x there, the differential dx, is the width of the infinitely many rectangles where we're adding up all that area. So we're really, really comfortable with finding area in the plane using the definite integral now and the fundamental theorem of calculus. We've always said that the area trapped in between our function and the horizontal axis is the area that we're after. So what we're going to explore now is what's called a plane region, an area of a plane region. And so if we're talking about a region in the plane, we're going to find that what we have normally counted as negative area, we're going to have to put a negative sign in front of that definite integral that's going to give us a negative value because our heights are going to be negative here. We're going to have to put a negative sign in front of that so that we will get a positive area for a region in the plane. And this is where context is important. The context of when do we count negative area as negative, in other words, when do we accumulate, versus when we count negative area as positive. And this is going to be a big clue. A region in the plane or a plane region is a big clue that we're going to count all area as positive. So let's see how we go about doing this. We've always stopped when we have found area. We've always stopped at the x-axis. It was any area trapped in between our function and the horizontal axis. And I say horizontal because our, our horizontal axis is not always x. Sometimes it's t or you know any other variable. So finding this would be relatively simple. We would start here at 0. We would stop at where this parabola, and here's our parabola, y1. We would stop where it crossed the x-axis, whatever this x value is. And that's what we would integrate. We would start at 0. We would stop at the question mark. And we would accumulate all the area, because it is positive area. Right, And so that would give us this green shaded region here. But here's the problem with this area. This function, this parabola, doesn't go all the way down to the horizontal axis. So if we started from this value and stopped at x equals 0, we're going to have more area in there than we need. This has an upper bounding curve that is y1, but it has a lower bounding curve that is y2. And this is the same thing. From 0 up to question mark, this area, this region, has a lower bounding curve that is y2 and an upper bounding curve that is the horizontal axis. But this little region over here has an upper bounding curve that's y1 and a lower bounding curve that's y2. So how on earth do we find area in the plane when it looks like this? And so we could indeed split the area into several different sections and we could try you know, adding and subtracting and so forth. But it turns out that if we take rectangles like we've always done and we're going to have infinitely many rectangles and we're going to start at the left x value here, we'll call that x sub 1 or we could just as easily call that a. And we're going to stop at the right endpoint value here. We'll call that x sub 2 or b. If we integrated, and remember we're integrating, we're adding up infinitely many rectangles from a up to b. And the rectangles have heights, just as before, times 
widths. So it's the height times the width. And if we have infinitely many of them, starting at A and stopping at B, our width is unchanged. Our width is still dx. But our heights are going to look a little different. Let's get rid of this so I can draw that a little more clearly. And we'll go back here. So here is A. Here is B. Our widths are still dx, but here's the height of a rectangle. The top of the rectangle is bounded by y1, and the bottom of the rectangle is bounded by y2. So the difference between y1 and y2 is going to give us our height for our rectangle. And if we add up infinitely many of them with a width of dx from a to b, that will give us our region in the plane. And we don't even have to worry about the fact that this would normally be counted as negative area since it's below the horizontal axis. This is going to take care of that for us. So here's where we are. We are finding the length of the strip or of a rectangle that has the height from the upper bounding curve, right, the upper bounding curve, whatever curve is on top, in this case it's y1, and the lower bounding curve, and in this case it's y2. So finding the heights of our rectangles is still pretty intuitive. And again, we're going to call our widths tiny changes in x. That's what our widths are going to look like. dx and then here's our heights. So y1 is 2 minus x squared and y2 is negative x. So what we've done here is we've taken y1 minus y2 and Algebraically, we've just cleaned it up. Here's y1, and we're taking the difference of y2. So you can see that that cleans up algebraically to what we have here, and then we have our widths. And we're going to stick that into an integral. And our limits of integration, we start at a. We said here's our value a right here. This is where we start integrating, and we stop here at our value b. Well, how do we find a and b? Where did the upper and lower limits of integration come from? Well, this lower limit comes from the intersection point between y1 and y2 on the left side of the y-axis, and b is the right intersection point on the right side of the y-axis. So what we've got to do is we've got to find a and we've got to find b. And we often have to do this on our own. We have to realize that those intersection points where y1 equals y2, that's what intersection points in the plane look like, where functions equal each other, that's where we're going to get the values of a and b. And we have to do this by hand a lot. So what we're going to do is we're going to set those two functions equal to each other, and we're going to find the x values that make that true. Hopefully we have a negative x value and a positive x value because we can see that's what we're going to need here. So I'm going to add x squared to both sides. I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. So hopefully you can go right here with me, and we know how to solve a quadratic equation. If it's factorable, we find its factors x times x is going to give us x squared. We're going to have a bigger minus than we are a plus. We're going to have to have 1 minus and 1 plus because that's negative. So either x minus 2 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. And that's how we find our intersection points. Here x equals 2 or x equals negative 1. So now we know we're going to integrate from negative 1 up to 2, and here is going to be the widths and the heights of all of our infinitely many rectangles. Now let's see, we'll go back and finish that up. So this will look like, we'll go ahead and find what that region in the plane is. We're going to integrate from negative 1 up to positive 2. We're integrating 2 minus x squared plus x. 
with respect to X. That process looks like, if you'll remember, find the antiderivative function. So you're going to have to show the antiderivative. You're going to state to the world, to all the AP readers, that you're going to do fundamental theorem. And then you're just going to plug in the upper limit minus plugging in the lower limit. We never have to clean up. Remember that. So all you have to do is just stick those values in there. Never, never, never simplify unless you have to pick that value up and do something else with it. So there's our answer. There is the, uh, there is the area of the region in the plane, very different from the accumulated area. So make sure that you pay attention to context. All right, so the formula, as you can see intuitively, we're going to find that area of the region in the plane. Our heights are going to be the differences in the upper bounding curve minus the lower bounding curve. Our widths are going to be with respect to x or tiny changes horizontally. And this, you know, it could be any x value. It doesn't necessarily always have to be the intersection points. The limits of integration are unique to each region in the plane that you are finding the area for. Now, here's the beauty part of this. We're going to use this so much that you really don't need to memorize the formula. It's going to be intuitive based on the region that you're working with. So not necessarily something you need to memorize. I just want you to have a clear idea that we're always working with an upper bounding curve minus a lower bounding curve. And then you ought to be able to deal with that just fine. All right, so when we talk about upper bounding curve and lower bounding curve, and we talk about accumulating starting at A and stopping at B, B would be down here. If we're going to accumulate this area, we're going to find upper bounding curve and lower bounding curve. So for this region, the upper bounding curve, we'll call this Y1 and we'll call this Y2. The upper bounding curve would be Y1, but the lower bounding curve would be the function Y equals zero. It would actually be the X axis, the horizontal axis. But if I took a rectangle height here, it's got a different upper bounding curve and lower bounding curve. Here the upper bound is y1 and the lower bound is y2. So very clearly here, at this x value, whatever it is, we have a change in the lower bounding curve. Here it's the horizontal axis. Here it's this line x minus 2. So we have some choices. We can integrate from a up to, we'll call this x sub 1. From a up to x sub 1, it would look like y1 minus x equals 0, or sorry, y equals 0. And then we would have to add to that the accumulated area from x sub 1 up to b. And the upper bounding curve there would be y1, and the lower bounding curve would be y2, and there are my widths. So it's perfectly doable. I've just got to break the integral up over the change in the upper and lower bounding curve. Well, it turns out that they're going to want you to integrate using the least number of integrals. Sometimes they're going to want you to integrate, and they're going to force you to use widths that are with respect to y instead of with respect to x. And this gets a little complicated. It's uncomfortable at first, but you're going to do it enough in several different contexts that you're going to be really comfortable with having integrals, definite integrals, that are in terms of y instead of in terms of x. So I'm near the end of this first video. I'm going to stop here. We'll pick up here, and we'll look at how we're going to do things with respect to y in this context. So look for the next video.